I'd like to uh, convene the uh, Ways and Means uh, Committee and uh, just to give uh, members and the audience a heads up. Uh, the reason we had to be very timely in uh, convening is that we're being uh, live streamed on the uh, city uh, website and uh, we were asked to start promptly at uh, 9 o'clock. So uh, that's uh, why I convened even though some people were still kind of standing around. Um, as we uh, get started, uh, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, the help in getting this all put together on the part of uh, not only our staff, but uh, some of the city staff that uh, helped uh, put this particular uh, hearing together. And uh, it was Lucy Martin, if you could maybe acknowledge, there we are, and uh, uh, Monica Hennessy. I don't see Monica Hennessy, but... Uh, and then uh, also, uh, oh, it's Monica Hennessy Mohan. I think that's the full name. Okay, well, at any rate, uh, thank you to the city staff for helping uh, put this together. Uh, I thought uh, to get things uh, started uh, before we have Mr. Marks uh, do his uh, presentation, um, I would like the uh, Speaker of the House to uh, comment a bit about the mini session and uh, maybe a little reflection of the past few days from your perspective. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted that so many members of the legislature decided to participate, really made this uh, a success. There were a lot of mini sessions in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, and it seemed time to give an old idea a new try. And Winona has really done an outstanding job. I think the three days that we've spent here bode well for the future of mini sessions. I think most people learned a tremendous amount from the local community. And we're very grateful for all of the work that people put in. You know, we'd like to think that the capital city of St. Paul is very accessible to everybody. And we'd like to think that we're all very easy to contact. But we think it's also important to come out into greater Minnesota and, and show folks that, that we care enough to be here and um, that you don't have to go to St. Paul to have an impact on, on what we're doing. So we wanted to come here. And, and be present and kind of make that case ourselves in person. So thanks again to the communities of Winona and Rochester and Austin for helping us have a very successful mini session, I think. And I'm looking forward to the discussion this morning. Thank you. And um, we will do a committee uh, introduction. So if you could maybe give your name and district uh, where you're from. District numbers sometimes don't necessarily uh, help people identify where you're from. So maybe. Uh, your primary uh, place of uh, residence. And uh, we can start over to my right with Representative Dreskowski, and we'll just go around the table with introductions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Dreskowski, I grew up right across a creek here in Bluff Siding, Wisconsin, an unincorporated community, <laughs> and uh, live at Mazeppa. My district line is about, uh, between myself and Representative Pulowski, is about three miles north or so of here. State Representative Joe Schumacher, I uh, grew up on the opposite side of the state from here, um, just along I-90 if you keep going down into Laverne. Representative Bob Vogel, I uh, live in Elko Newmark and I represent Southern Scott and Western Lease Organs. Good morning everyone, I'm State Representative Jerry Hurtas. I reside in Greenfield, Minnesota, which is uh, in Hennepin County, the very northwest uh, part of it. I represent that uh, area of Hennepin County, about a third of the county geographically, and there are 11 cities uh, that I represent in western Hennepin. I'm State Representative Peggy Scott, and I represent the cities of Andover, northern Coon Rapids, and one precinct in the city of Ramsey. Let me revert back to Jim being that's just grabbed a seat. Thank going you down much. the table, so. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Representative Jim Davney, Minneapolis. Uh, good morning, State Representative Paul Torkelson. I represent uh, all of Brown County, most of Redwood, and a little bit of Renville. I live on Lake Hanska in southern Brown County, acting as lead this morning. Could I ask the mayor a question? Well, uh, if we could finish perhaps the introductions okay. first, and then uh, I'd be happy <laughs> it would, to It would only take back. a second. Well, all right, go ahead. We'll there were some fireworks last night, and we don't know where they came from. Any idea? I have no idea. I never heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Nancy Connolly, the, the, the chair, the uh, the staff person, and my wife both saw them, and I don't think they were hallucinating. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Ah, enough said. <laughs> the community is so engaged. Um, I'm State Representative Melissa Hortman. I represent a little further up the Mississippi River, uh, the counties of Anoka and Hennepin, and the cities of Coon Rapids and Brooklyn Park. And as we indicated earlier, the Speaker of the House. I'm uh, Lyndon Carlson. I chair the Ways and Means Committee. My district is in the northwest uh, suburbs of Minneapolis. I represent parts of uh, Crystal, New Hope, and Plymouth. Good morning. My name is Ryan Winkler. I represent just south of Lyndon Carlson, parts of Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, Plymouth, and the community of Medicine Lake. And I also uh, serve as the Majority Leader of the Minnesota House. Representative Gene Pulowski. I represent Winona, Lewiston, Homer and nine people in La Crescent. <laughs> Seven of them did. <laughs> the, uh, by the way, uh, Representative Pulowski was very involved when we had our very first mini session uh, here a number of years ago. Thirty, but who counts? Thirty years, okay. And uh, so uh, we're, re we're revisiting the concept of uh, getting the uh, legislature out and about, as uh, the speaker indicated. And uh, Representative Pulowski, your local representative, has been very involved with the planning process for this one. Alice? Uh, I'm Alice Hausman. I represent a couple of neighborhoods in St. Paul, St. Anthony Park and Como Park, and three <coughs> suburban cities, Falcon Heights, Lauderdale, and most of Roseville. If you have been to the State Fair, you have been in my district. I'm Jean Poppy, State Representative, and I grew up in Houston, Minnesota. I now represent Austin, Minnesota, and surrounding communities. I'm Representative Paul Marquardt. I live in Dilworth, which is right next to the city of Moorhead, and I represent all or parts of Clay, Norman, and Becker County. Good morning. I'm Representative Leon Lilly, and I represent the cities of North St. Paul, Maplewood, and Oakdale. Thank you for having us. Gene Lagunias, representing far south Minneapolis and the northeast section of Virginia. Hi, uh, good morning. State Representative Frank Hornstein. The area I represent uh, includes parts of downtown Minneapolis and southwest Minneapolis. Okay, so you see we have a, a good cross-section of the uh, state here, and uh, there's a very uh, bipartisan representation here this morning uh, with the committee. Oh, oh, excuse me. I didn't realize we had people sitting behind me. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Rena Moran. I represent St. Paul, Minnesota. Good morning. I'm Representative Peter Fisher. I represent the communities of Maplewood, White Bear Lake, Birchwood, Monomita, and Wilderney. Good morning. My name is Nick Zerlas. I represent uh, Sherbert and Wright Counties. John Petersburg, Oletown, and Waseca. Did I miss anyone else? Okay. Um, we uh, have uh, on the agenda uh, the chief uh, fiscal analyst for the Minnesota House. And by, uh, way, uh, by way of background, the Ways and Means Committee is uh, intimately involved with the budgetary process for the Minnesota House. Uh, one of our key responsibilities is to set what we call the targets or the budget resolution, which would, which would determine the uh, spending, le spending levels from the House perspective of each of the fiscal committees. And uh, so that's a very important part of our uh, role. And then uh, in the end, uh, near the end of the session, virtually all of the uh, bills with a fiscal impact go through ways and means before they are uh, reported to the House floor. So that's in a very general way uh, the role of the Ways and Means uh, Committee. So uh, Mr. Marks is our chief fiscal analyst, and uh, he's going to go over uh, a uh, few sheets that uh, give an explanation of the budgetary process. Um, but I should point out, uh, we did acknowledge, uh, due to fireworks, the mayor earlier, but maybe if uh, the mayor could uh, raise his hand and uh, indicate his presence. And uh, Mr. Mayor, are there any other council members uh, or elected officials uh, present in the audience? Okay. Okay, well, thank you for being. Which one? Oh. Chair of the County Board. 
And I also want to say I appreciate the staff that worked with the planning committee um, to put together the agenda. It was literally built from the ground up, so we appreciate the time and the work that went into that. Okay, well, thank you. Um, my name is Chris Meyer. I'm also on the planning committee. Thank you. Is there anyone else? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Anyone else that we uh, should acknowledge that's here in the audience? Well, thank you for being here. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, oh, did we have a couple more arrivals? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Dave Baker from Wilmer. Thank you. Representing. And uh, Todd Hamilton has joined us. Uh, okay. And. Uh, Representative Hamilton, uh, we asked people to say where they were from. Oh, Mount Lake. Mount Lake, Minnesota. Okay. So you see we have a good cross-section of uh, the state of Minnesota here today. Uh, what I'm going to uh, ask if uh, we may is uh, that Mr. Marks will do his uh, presentation. And uh, unless you have a real pressing question, let's hold questions from committee members until he uh, walks through his presentation. But um, we'll... Uh, if you have a real pressing uh, question, let me know. Otherwise, we'll take those questions at the end. Mr. Marks? Good morning. Thank you. Uh, just to mention, there are copies of the handout over here on the table if uh, people don't have them. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members, my goal here is to do a very brief overview of the state budget and uh, uh, just to kind of set a perspective for it. So, um, the uh, on Page two, uh, I'm not going to go through this other than to emphasize the middle bullet here, which is that the state budget is on a biannual basis, and so all the numbers you're going to be looking at are for a two-year period for the, for the biennium that started July 1st of 2019 and runs till June 30th of 2021. But the, the important point here, when you, if you're making comparisons to city or county or other budgets, uh, this is the budget for a two-year basis, so the numbers include two years of, uh, of funding here. Uh, okay, on, then uh, we're going to look at the state budget in two parts here. The, the first uh, several uh, graphs are the all-funds budget, as we would call it, or basically all of the state's operating funds. Uh, the, uh, the fund that we spend the most time with is the general fund, and we will get to that in a, in a couple minutes. But uh, this, this, is, this is looking at all funds, so it includes federal funds, it includes dedicated funds like Trunk Highway Fund, it includes things like Game and Fish Fund, and so on. Uh, and uh, as we look at the, the spending sides of this, you'll see what those funds are. The, the all funds budget, uh, the, the legislature, uh, all of these, the, the, the collection, the spending of all this money is authorized in state law. A lot of the non-general fund areas are authorized in permanent law, or what we would call statutory appropriations. And uh, uh, while they can be changed, they can be reviewed uh, every legislative session, a lot of them continue, if, even if they're not uh, reviewed or looked at or even mentioned in, in the law of that session, they are, they are written in permanent statute. Uh, the numbers here, uh, total revenues in the all funds budget, 87.4 billion for the two year period. And you can see the big categories of state revenue. Uh, federal grants, uh, which <coughs> pass through the state treasury, actually make up the biggest chunk at 30.2%. Income tax at 29%, uh, sales tax at 17%, and then a variety of other categories here. And on the page, the next page in the handout, it's not, in, not going to be in the slides, are the numbers for these categories. Uh, so if you want to look at the numbers, you can see them there. Then on page five in the handout, uh, expenditures in all funds by program. Uh, if you look at the total number, uh, 88.8 billion of spending, uh, that's about a billion higher than uh, the revenue. That's because of money carried forward uh, uh, from the previous biennium. And it's pretty safe to say that this 88.8 billion is showing up here. It's not all of it will probably get spent. Some of that will get carried forward, carried forward into the next biennium as well. But at this point, uh, it's projected to be spent. Uh, if you look at the all funds budget here, then health and human services is the biggest area of spending. This is in the all funds budget. When we look at general fund, it's going to be education. 
Uh, the difference is largely the federal money that comes into the state for, uh, for lots of health and human service purposes. But uh, health and human services, uh, in looking at spending by program at 44%, uh, K-12 education uh, uh, close to 25%, and then other categories, uh, 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 none of them other, none of the other ones exceed 10%, transportation almost at 10% in that grouping. Then the next, uh, and then the next page shows the, the numbers, the next page in the handout shows the numbers for those particular categories. Uh, the page labeled page uh, seven in the handout uh, is looking is look, taking the same state spending and showing it by fund. So instead of by programs showing it by fund, uh, you can see that the general fund is about half, 50.2% of the total. Federal funds just under 30%. Uh, transportation and transit about 7.6. Uh, uh, the debt service uh, at 2.2 in, uh, in the upper right hand side, that's the, that's the payments uh, to pay off general obligation bonds, the, uh, the, the long term debt that the state enters into to build buildings and repair buildings and so on. Uh, the other, the special revenue uh, fund, which is uh, also in the upper right hand side at 4.4%, that is a conglomeration of lots of different items. Uh, it, uh, there are over a thousand accounts or separate uh, spending accounts within that, and they include uh, uh, any number of things. They, they, they include any, some of the, the licensing fees. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're an attorney and you get your attorney's license and you pay that to the state, that uh, goes into the special revenue fund. If you're, if you're a state agency and you hold workshops, so like the Department of Education holding workshops for teachers and charge a fee for that, <coughs> and then use that fee to pay for workshops in the future, that goes into an account in the Special Revenue Fund. Uh, there are, well, over a thousand in that particular fund. So. Uh, the, uh, I would call your attention to page eight in the handout. Uh, that lists all the particular, all the funds on the previous graph. A lot of them were in the other category and a lot of them are relatively small, but you can see the, the whole list of, uh, I believe it's 35 or 36 separate funds that, uh, that the state has in what are considered operating funds. And as I said before, most of these funds, uh, 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 not uh, probably two-thirds of them are statutorily appropriated uh, where the money, is, uh, the money comes in, the money is appropriated in the statute. Okay, then, uh, getting down to the general fund, the fund where the legislature and the governor spend most of their time and where there is the most flexibility. Uh, this looks at where general fund resources come from. Um, and the general fund resources for the 20, fiscal 2021 biennium at 48.2 billion. And you can see the two big categories there, individual income tax at 53%, sales tax at 24.7%. Uh, the two of those are over three quarters of the, the revenue in the state budget. And, uh, and one thing to keep in mind when you think about revenue in the state budget, these are two areas that are affected by what's going on in the economy. Uh, people pay income taxes based on the amount of money they're making. They, they pay sales taxes based on what they buy and how much money they're spending. So that's how the economy plays into uh, uh, whether the state has more revenue or less revenue. Corporate income tax is 6.6%, uh, and then uh, various other categories on there, and the uh, chart on the next page goes into more detail on what those other categories are. Then on page 11 in the handout, uh, it shows general fund spending for the 2021 biennium. Uh, general fund, fund spending at 48.5 billion. Uh, slightly more than the, uh, the general fund revenue number, and again, that's because of money carried forward from the previous biennium uh, in uh, and balance forward, as it's, as it's called. When we look at general fund spending, uh, elementary secondary education is the largest category at 41.5%, health and human services then at 30.5%, and then on the, uh, the right side of the chart, higher education at 7%, property tax aids and credits, which includes aids to local governments, aids to cities and counties, as well as various uh, programs for property tax relief at 7.8%. Uh, an example of 
uh, where it makes a big difference here as far as general fund and other funds, if you look at transportation, uh, the fourth one up on the, the left side, transportation out of the general fund budget is at seven-tenths of a percent. Transportation in the all funds budget was 9.8 percent. That's because transportation, most transportation spending is in things like the Trump Highway Fund or various transit funds. It's not in the general fund. So that's a quick run through of these, the, the funding, the all funds budget, the general fund budget. Uh, one couple other pages here, uh, the current general fund budget situation, some, some points here. Uh, at the end of the 2019 legislative session, the fiscal 18-19 biennium, uh, now the previous biennium, was projected to end with a $606 million balance. And I talked about that balance that carries forward into the current biennium. Uh, as of July, we knew that uh, fiscal 19 revenue was 636 million more than was forecasted, uh, and within that 636, 450 million of it was income taxes. The income taxes were, were that much higher than forecasted. Uh, we don't have the detailed information yet, but uh, spending is almost always or is always less than was forecasted, and so the, the fiscal at 19 ending balance will also be bigger because of, of that. And those final numbers will be released when Minnesota Management and Budget releases the November forecast, probably in the first week of December. Uh, also mentioned here, and it's not written on the page, uh, the 2019, the 2019 legislature authorized three contingent appropriations based on the fiscal 19 ending balance, or based on whether or not the fiscal 19 balance was going to be greater than was projected at the end of the session. <clears throat> the Commissioner of Management and Budget announced yesterday that they knew it was going to be and they were authorizing that spending. That, uh, those amounts, it's $20 million that will be transferred to the Disaster Contingency Account, uh, $13 million that will be appropriated for Metro Mobility in Fiscal 21, and then $30 million that's appropriated for school safety grants. So those are now authorized, uh, that money is now authorized to be spent. And following up here, uh, in the first two, two months of fiscal year 2020, revenue has been 83 million higher than forecasted. Uh, at the end of the 2019 legis moving, looking into 2021, then at the end of the 2019 legislative session, the fiscal 2021 balance was was projected to be 242 million, and that included the 606 million carried forward from fiscal 19. I already mentioned a large share of Minnesota tax revenue is dependent on economic changes. And then a few statistics in the last bullet, the uh, state's budget reserve is at $2.075 billion. In addition, the cash flow account has $350 million in it. Uh, and then uh, an MN MNB issues a report every September 30th that recommends a budget reserve amount. The numbers in here are no longer correct because that new report also came out this week. Uh, MNB now recommends the budget reserve be at 4.9% of revenue instead of 5%. And 4.9% uh, 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 would be uh, $2.334 billion based on the current project revenue projection. That's a dynamic number. It changes, changes every time the revenue uh, forecast is issued. And then one other note, at the time of the November forecast, 33% of the fiscal 2021 balance, if there is one, will be transferred to the budget research. Uh, the last page, uh, just some notes, uh, the next uh, State, uh, uh, a key point in the state budgeting will be a November forecast, and uh, that forecast will be issued in late November or early December. The law allows it to be as late as the first week in December, and that forecast will provide final revenue and spending numbers for fiscal, uh, uh, fiscal 18 and 19, the biennium that ended June 30th. It will update revenue and spending for the current biennium, fiscal 2021, and it will also update the planning estimates for the next biennium. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, and uh, before we go to questions, I should acknowledge uh, we've had some additional uh, members that uh, have joined us. The vice chair of the committee, uh, Liz Olson. I'm not sure where she's. Oh, there at the end. Okay, and uh, from Duluth, um, and then uh, Diane Loeffler is over here and uh, represents uh, Northeast uh, Minneapolis. And then we have uh, Sandy Mason who's joined us and uh, 
is it Egan, if I recall? Egan. Yeah, represents uh, the suburb of uh, Egan. So uh, we've had uh, more members that uh, have joined us, and thank you for uh, being here. Um, Mr. Marks, uh, as we go to questions, uh, you mentioned the forecast, and that it'll be out in December, and that usually generates a fair amount of discussion and headlines. Uh, maybe you could share with uh, the committee and the members of the audience uh, just what that process is. Uh, you and I and some others uh, meet uh, prior to the forecast, but if you could maybe just tell members uh, what that process is. Mr. Chair, members, there are, there are really two parts to the forecast. The, the forecast projects <coughs> revenue and it also projects spending. And so it, uh, the, the spending part of the forecast is work that's largely done in various agencies, the Department of Human Services, the Department of Education, as far as projecting enrollments and uh, uh, Department of Human Services projecting needs and medical assistance, which would be the largest forecasting program there. It's those programs that have forecasted expenditures or where, where the law is written, like in the general education aid formula, a certain number of dollars times the number of pupil units. And so that's subject to change whenever pupil units are forecasted. The same sort of thing in medical assistance, the number of people who are eligible for medical assistance. So, so that's one part of the <coughs> forecast. Those appropriations that are forecasted or, or not set, uh, an appropriation where $10 million is appropriate for something, that's not going to change, but uh, those uh, that, where they have formulas written in statute could change depending on the need there on the spending side. And then on the revenue side, it's a probably a more complicated process in that uh, uh, the uh, Minnesota management and budget economists look at what's going, what are the national trends, what's going on in the economy. Uh, the Minnesota forecast is based on a forecast done by a, a company called IHS Market, which does a monthly uh, economic forecast. And then the economists at Minnesota management and budget take that information, as well as what's, what the current revenue trends are in Minnesota and uh, build a revenue forecast for income taxes, for sales taxes, and for other revenue sources based on uh, those forecasts and, uh, and what the, the most recent information is from Minnesota. The revenue part, the spending part come together and, and uh, then there's a projected budget balance that comes out of that. And as I had mentioned here, this forecast will, will complete the process for fiscal year 2018 and 19 for the last biennium. That, this is the last forecast that will deal with that biennium, and then it will uh, update the projections for 2021 and 22-23. And uh, the Council of Economic Advisors uh, will meet uh, prior to the November forecast, which will come out, uh, as was pointed out, in early uh, December, and that's uh, a number of uh, leading economists, including uh, representatives of the Federal Reserve and so on, and. Uh, they have a pretty thorough discussion of the state economy and how we fit into uh, the national outlook as well as uh, our own state economy. And then we have the uh, state economist who uh, massages all of that and uh, works uh, through MMB uh, and comes out with the uh, projections that will be released in December. Oh, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have uh, just a couple of questions for Mr. Marks. Mr. Marks, thank you uh, for that overview. Um, you said that the budget reserve target has been decreased to 4.9 or less than the 5 percent, and you gave that number, and I didn't catch that to write it down. Could you give me that number again? Mr. Chair, Representative Hurtas, the number is $2.33 billion. Um, as an aside, I'd also mention that in the letter uh, from MMB, when they decreased the percentage, uh, they say, it, as, as they examine the state's revenue sources, they appear to be slightly less volatile than they did a year ago. And that was the reason for decreasing the percent from 5.0 to 4.9. Mr. Chair. Representative Hurtas. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Marks, then we're about $250 million away from being fully funded for the next uh, estimated budget reserve requirement. Is that correct? Mr. Mark. Mr. Chair, Representative Hurtas, yes, that's correct. Okay. And if we are fully funded uh, with our budget reserve, then does our previous requirement of transferring a third of our surplus uh, revenues still 
uh, have to be met, or uh, are we free to use that money as uh, most people in the audience might be looking for help? <laughs> Mr. Chair, Representative Vertas, the requirement is 33% up to the recommended uh, cap, so it would, it would be the $250 million. If, if the 33% was greater than that, no, it wouldn't be 33%, it would be whatever that amount was okay. that would get us there. Uh, keeping in mind that that amount is going to change in November too because revenue will be reforecasted and so 4.9% uh, of revenue, if it's a higher number, could be higher than the 233, 2.334 billion. Representative Hurtas. Thank you. So, Mr. Marks, if, if for example, there's a $900 million uh, budget surplus uh, estimate in the forecast and that a third of that would be $300 million, 250 million being required to be fully funded for the budget reserve that would leave an additional 50 million dollars available for the legislature to choose to do what it wants. Mr. Chair, recommend for us. Yes, that's correct. All right, thank you. Yeah, we got one other question. Uh, we wanted to go fairly quickly to hear from the people, but uh, if go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Marks, how long have you been with um, House in the House doing this job? Mr. Chair and Representative Scott, this particular job since 1997. I've uh, worked. I interned in House Research in 1976. <laughs> Thus, the gray hair. Um, Mr. He's, he's been there almost as long as one of the members of this committee. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, I have a question about the contingency spending because I've been in the legislature going on 12 years, and I've not seen you know an item like that in our final budget where you know something is contingent on. Um, a final balance of our of our um, state cough from our state coffers, and I'm just wondering in your time have you seen that before, like a contingency type line item? Mr. Chair and Representative Scott, yes, it's happened several times, and uh, one of them that I can recall, which Representative Torkelson would remember, is 22 million several years ago uh, transferred to the Clean Water Fund uh, to replace the Clean Water Fund spending that some people argue against. And uh, uh, I also recall uh, in, 19, I believe it was 1995, there was uh, $50 added to the general education formula, depending on the amount of money that showed up in a forecast. I don't remember the specific details if that was an end of the previous biennium balance or if that was additional money in the November forecast for that year. But uh, it has happened, and, and it has, I believe it's happened some additional times, but I can't recall details right now. Thank you. Okay, what I'd uh, like to do, I remember we're being, uh, we're live, and uh, one of the purposes of being here um, in Monona is to hear from the community. So um, I do want to uh, open it up uh, for testimony. And uh, as the uh, speaker has pointed out at other meetings and uh, this morning, uh, we do want to hear from the, uh, from the public. And, uh, you know, we are outside of St. Paul for that very purpose to uh, hear from the people in uh, southeastern Minnesota and today in particular Winona. So thank you, Mr. Marks. And uh, I understand that there are some uh, in the audience that uh, perhaps would like to uh, testify. So if you'd feel free to come forward. Oh, here we go with the list. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, I guess the mayor was first. Mark Peterson. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, and Madam Speaker, and committee members. Uh, my name is Mark Peterson. I'm the mayor of the city of Winona. I've been the mayor for the past almost seven years. And uh, this is probably my final chance to say thank you for choosing Winona to come here and to uh, hold your mini session. It's been a real privilege to be a part of this and it's been uh, enlightening in many ways. And I'd want to recognize our representative, Gene Pulowski, and his efforts to uh, have you come here and, and do this. Uh, thank you again. It's been wonderful. Um, I have a brief, uh, some brief comments, and with me is, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Lucy McMartin. I'm the Director of Community Development for the City of Winona. Uh, 
and thank you again for allowing us to testify this morning. Winona is an old city, and so is our infrastructure. This means our city must make long needed improvements to streets, infrastructure, including our downtown. Winona has brought our own public and private resources together to fund key projects that are bringing jobs to our downtown, creating new housing and public spaces, and connections to the Mississippi River. To build on the success of Opportunity Winona, we have developed the next phase of our plan and identified some legislative priorities that will help us do even more for our community to continue to be able to retain and attract businesses, residents, and visitors. In the months to come, we will be asking for a partnership to continue efforts for our regional center we call Winona. We believe we are a part of the economic engine of southeastern Minnesota and the state of Minnesota. Over $300 million in taxable sales occur in the city of Winona, sending $22 million in sales tax to the state in 2017. Through Opportunity Winona, we have invested over $6 million in public funds, and there have been $40 million in private investment to date. We plan to build on the success and plan to invest further in our community. We're grateful for the opportunity to talk to you through this session, and thank you for reaching out to Greater Minnesota and holding events in our city. Yesterday, I testified before the Tax Committee, and I failed to mention something that I want to just throw out this morning that I think is very important, and those are the historic tax credits. These historic tax credits are making a big difference in our city. A uh, number of projects, including uh, 102 Walnut, the Latch Building, uh, Mason Char, which was a burned out uh, shell of a building three and a half years ago, have all been brought back and, and, uh, and people have invested in these, and it's really been largely because of these you know, historic tax credits. And I would uh, very much hope that those continue. So, with that, and I would point out the chair of the tax committee is here at this meeting as well, and uh, a couple of others uh, on the committee are on taxes, so so you got the word in. Okay. Uh, Ms. McMartin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'd like to start by sharing a little bit of information about how valuable the tools are that are provided by the state of Minnesota for economic development and for housing. In Winona, as you've seen on your visit here, that we're blessed with a beautiful setting, including the Bluffs and Mississippi River. And while that's great for arts, tourism, and outdoor recreation, it can be a challenge for development and redevelopment that's so important to our city. We rely on the tools through the Department of uh, Employment and Economic Development such as the Minnesota Investment Fund, infrastructure grants, cleanup funds because we're an old industrial riverfront, uh, and local tools such as tax increment financing and tax abatement. Also, the mayor mentioned historic tax credits, which have been used <coughs> extensively since the state of Minnesota allocated 20% to match the federal credit. We use these tools on behalf of businesses and developers when they're needed. We have used them judiciously and appreciate that they remain flexible and can change with our growing needs. An example of, an, an example of considering flexibility could be the Minnesota Investment Fund. Loan amounts are based solely on the number of jobs created, and with the unemployment rate hovering around 3%, Perhaps total payroll for better paying jobs or increased productivity could be considered a measure for the loans. I also wanted to thank you for the transportation funds uh, through the Port Development Assistance Fund. Transportation is a key to economic development and many of you saw our port and how active it is. We also, as part of economic development, uh, hear about our needs for housing and continuing programs such as the Low Income Housing Tax Credit are extremely <coughs> important for our city. Over 60% of the people who work in Winona drive here and do not live here. In closing, I just wanted to thank you for your support and, to, and for continuing to make these tools available to us. I think that helps us have a positive economic impact on Winona and the state of Minnesota. Thank you. 
<clears throat> well, thank you both. And uh, I want to thank uh, Ms. McMartin. Uh, yesterday we had a conversation. My very first teaching position was in this region, St. Charles, Minnesota, mm -hmm. and she was very familiar with the community. So we had a nice conversation when we were doing some of the tours yesterday. So thank you for that conversation as well. How long, how long did you teach in St. Charles? I was just down there a year, 64, 65. And I was from the city, so I went back up to the cities uh, to teach. But, uh, you know, I learned an awful lot when I was down here uh, that one year because I grew up in Minneapolis, and that was a farming community. And some of what I learned there really helped me in the legislature, you know, because you have an understanding of the uh, rural areas, uh, even though it was just uh, a little over a year that I was there. But thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Charles with uh, Child Welfare Social Service Department. All right, get the microphone. Good morning. Okay, like I'm super excited because this is what I teach, democracy in action. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Dr. Ruth Charles. I'm a professor at the Social Work Department at Winona State. I am an IFO member. I'm also the uh, BSW 4E coordinator for child welfare, so I train bachelor level social workers to work in the Minnesota counties in foster care and in child welfare. I'm also part of the Win Winona County Human Service Advisory Board and the chair of that. And for fun, and what I love, I'm also part of the coordinator of the Winona ACEs, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Initiative that we have here in this community. And Brian Vordick um, has also been working with me on this. I don't have to tell you um, that Human Services takes up a large part of the Minnesota budget. And I don't have to tell you that I know you guys get a lot of requests. What I do have is a request that when you get these requests or these proposals, that you please make them be evidence-based on research, on brain science, and that you use the most recent information that we have on brain science, because this is where we are moving. When was the last time you took a human bio class or intro to psychology? It's been a while, huh? <coughs> We are learning so much every day about how this body works, how our brains work, and especially we're also learning about the impact of trauma and how trauma um, really impacts how we interact with the world around us. Um, early, with, when you're looking at early childhood, a child's brain, 90% of your brain developed between the ages of zero and three. But you don't have the conscious memory of that. Because typically, it's, your, your conscious memory isn't until about age four. But one of the things is that your body does remember. Your body does remember those experiences and those traumas that happened to you. And what's so important is that when you're talking about it, and when you're, a lot of times you will respond to something without <clears throat> knowing why. And that is critical. So when you're looking at programs and when you're looking at different pieces and things that are going on, to be aware of trauma and to make sure that this is built into what's going on. And one of the reasons why this committee would be really, really want to know about this is that there is data, I didn't bring it with me today, but there is data that shows that it is cost effective. And that when, and this has been done in numerous states from Washington to locally here, Iowa and Wisconsin are doing a lot of these programs. So when you're looking at creating like a housing program, a lot of times they don't work. But sometimes it's because we haven't addressed the trauma, why some people can't maintain their housing. So we need to be thinking about that. Another piece is to realize, is to realize that historical trauma is real. Historical trauma and this goes into how your genes were developed in your body and, and passed down. And what historical trauma is where you're, you know, it, it's been passed down through the generations before. And in particular, and especially in our state of Minnesota, what has happened to the Native Americans, our First Nation populations, as well as African Americans, what's happened to them, that this really does make a difference in their ability to know what's going on why they respond and not knowing how and why and what's going on. Part of what we're doing here in Winona 
is we've developed the Winona ACEs initiative, and ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. It's based on brain science, and it's based using the issue of trauma. And just so you know, when the initial ACEs research was done, and some of you are at the committee I, I talked to yesterday, um, they, did a, they did a research project on this. It was with the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente. And with their sample of 17,000 um, individuals, over 63% in this initial sample showed that they had experienced trauma. And this is also with a very finite idea of how they were defining trauma. And now we know it's much more. But here in Winona, we've already talked to over 200 individuals, done presentations. We have people on our list that are already in, you know, understand this and are looking at how to use this. And we've already had over um, 2,000 people that we've already talked to or presented to, from everything from PowerPoints to some of you have played with my glitter balls and how we're learning to teach people how to breed. And so this is part of what we're at. And I'm going to let Brian talk about what we're doing now. Okay, and if you could identify yourself for the record as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, good morning. My name is Brian Verdi. I'm the Executive Director of Engage Winona. So good morning, Mr. Chair, Madam Speaker representatives, uh, we really, so I do civic engagement for a living and I just wanted to express a moment of appreciation for not just the fact that you're here, but how you showed up in our community. We really appreciate that you're here to listen and to engage and to just be out and about in all these places doing really great work um, that folks like Jean have known really well for a long time and it's been really exciting to share all that with you. Um, just briefly, so my role is as the coordinator of the One on Aces initiative um, and so we have done we have sort of bootstrapped this work for two years with a uh, few minor grants of about ten thousand dollars total um, Ruth has mentioned there's been hundreds of presentations there's been major structural changes at organizations across the community um, there's been events there's been awareness and education uh, and we've done really amazing work with very limited resources and are just looking for the opportunity to do even more work uh, with more capacity, financial capacity. I think the beautiful thing about ACEs and trauma-informed work from my perspective, I work in all kinds of areas, entrepreneurship and economic development and youth mental health and all kinds of <coughs> civic issues. And there's nothing maybe closer to the core of what prevents real transformative action in terms of civic participation and community change than dealing with trauma. Um, and so we see that present when we're doing work around housing. We see it present when we're doing work around health care. We see it present when we're doing work around law enforcement and drug addiction and all kinds of issues. Um, the idea of building a trauma-informed, resilient community is really critical, I think, for the success, not just of Winona, but to communities across the state. And to do that work means to create an impact across all of these issues. So we're continuing to do really incredible work from all kinds of sort of volunteer and cobbled together efforts. And we also know that there have been some opportunities at the state level to fund this work, uh, both in Winona and across the state, and really see that the potential to have transformative effects, uh, not just specifically around this idea of trauma, but in all of the issues that uh, we struggle to address in really transformative ways. Okay, thank you. Did, any, or did you have additional comments? Oh, it looked like you were going to grab the mic again. So. <laughs> Hey, I'm a professor. I can talk for two hours and no problem. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to dismiss you okay. earlier than you uh, yeah. wanted to uh, no. to, uh, to leave the table. But thank you for testifying. And uh, we'll now hear from uh, Jennifer uh, Chirenga. Chirenga. With Winona State University. Welcome. members of the committee. Um, my name is Jennifer Chernega, and I'm here today representing the faculty of Winona State University and the Interfaculty Organization. I'm the Faculty Association President here at WSU, and I often say that what an incredible honor it is to have been elected to represent this faculty at this particular university. I hope after having spent a few days here in Winona and on our campus, you understand exactly why that's such a great honor. Throughout this mini-session, various committees have heard from WSU faculty, staff, and students about the work being done in our community. We've also seen the challenges we face. Investments in public higher education have ripple effects through communities like Winona. 
every business, every organization represented over the last few days likely has a connection to Winona State University. Uh, whether it's from hiring our WSU graduates, to providing internship opportunities for our students, to collaborating with faculty and staff on programs like the one that Dr. Charles uh, described, that benefit all of our neighbors. These investments help Winona State University, help our region and the state of Minnesota. As our Chancellor, Devinder Maholtra, has asserted, the most important work for us moving forward is eliminating the post-secondary racial achievement gaps. The faculty of Minn State are dedicated to meeting the goal set out by the Minnesota Legislature of 70% of Minnesotans earning a post-secondary degree by 2025. But the only way to accomplish that goal is by eliminating the opportunity gaps in higher education. And the only way to eliminate those gaps is through Minn State. We are already the system of choice for students of color. Currently, Minn State campuses serve more students of color, over 64,000 students across the state of Minnesota, than the total number of students who attend the U of M Twin Cities in its entirety. But we still have gaps in terms of success. Unless we have a partner in our state government and a focused and deliberate plan to serve our marginalized communities, we will not meet the 70% uh, goal set by the legislature or our goal to close the achievement gap. We need to protect programs that enhance the experience of marginalized students while also investing in innovative uh, opportunities to ensure that even more students have success in our classrooms, in our communities, and ultimately earn their degrees. This is going to mean having uncomfortable conversations on our campuses, amongst our faculty, and rethinking the way we serve our students. Our faculty are committed to that work, but we need your help. We have appreciated bipartisan leadership and support on higher education issues from former higher ed chairs Nornis and our very own Representative Pulowski. Many of you may remember uh, that Representative Pulowski led the charge uh, for historic investments in higher education starting in 2013. However, there is still a long way to go to return us to the historic and statutory level of state funding, two-thirds of the cost of an education uh, or attendance at a state college or university. We're still below 50% of that state funding, which means the state has shifted the burden of the cost of higher education to students and families, leading to an unsustainable level of student debt. We have seen increases in state funding, but those increases have not kept up with inflation and have included unfunded tuition restrictions. This meant continued cuts to campuses, cuts that have begun to compound and have dramatic effects on the educational opportunities we can offer Minnesotans. Most importantly, these budget reductions have had a huge impact on students. In 2018, as part of a $5.8 million budget cut, Winona State lost 33 full-time faculty lines through attrition. 33 full-time faculty lines. Those lost positions mean fewer courses for students, longer wait times to get into classes, fewer opportunities of when and how students can take courses, and longer times to graduation. This hurts our students, and it drives up student debt. Next year, we face another three to five million dollars in cuts on this campus alone. Programs across our university are in danger. Students and my colleagues from our six other state universities have dealt with even more dramatic impacts. Currently, each of the state universities and Minn State colleges are facing extraordinary challenges. Just last month, eight tenured faculty members at, Winona, at, Saint, sorry, at St. Cloud State University were notified that they will be laid off in May. Laying off tenured faculty should be the absolute <coughs> last resort when managing budgets. We have set lofty and laudable goals for us, and we have responded with our own set of critical goals for educating the people of the state of Minnesota. We cannot accomplish these goals without your support. We urge you to continue working to increase investments to all of our campuses, to protect quality and affordability, and to help us create great educations for all Minnesotans. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, I think what uh, we'll do is try to get through the testimony uh, first. I've for the members of the committee and the audience, they've given me a relatively tight timeline because of this being Skyped. Uh, so uh, we'll take questions depending on time near the end, if that's all right, and if you're going to be available 
Thank you. Um, the next uh, person is uh, Annette, uh, is it Freehart? Farheit, okay, and that's uh, the superintendent of the Winona Area Public Schools. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Speaker of the House, Representatives, and um, committee members. First of all, I want to thank you for coming down to Winona, and actually, I don't know if any of you spent some time yesterday at our Winona Area Public Schools High School. I want to thank our WBA, our Winona Education Association, for being very active in organizing that. And that's just an example of what we have here in Winona. I became the superintendent of Winona Area Public Schools on July 1st, so I've been here about two and a half months, three months. It has been an extremely rewarding change for me. I um, have been in education since 1988. And I can tell you in that time I've seen many, many changes in the educational landscape. Uh, I'm going to address you today into speaking about just fund funding for education in general. Because since 1988 we have seen many, many changes. One of the things that I would like to address is early childhood uh, education. As you heard from Dr. Charles, those ACEs and trauma-informed practices are extremely important as we look at our early childhood. And ensuring that schools can help support and work with those partners that we have in our communities to address these with our children will be essential to closing our achievement gap within our, our, our society. We've all, you've also heard about the need for special education cross-subsidy addressing that funding. You've heard about the mental health issues of our students and our staff and the importance of really providing funding to help support that. We thank you for the schooling mental health services that have been put into schools. They continue to have impact for our families and our students, so I encourage you to always consider that as we look at it. Um, our society has changed in landscape. The poverty, mass shootings since 9-11 attacks, the drug and rural uh, impact, um, or the drug impact, and then also as we look at our rural, the suicide rate among our farmers, we in this area um, have, um, been, have been impacted by that. And so that mental health work that we do within our schools for our students and our staff and working with our county services are extremely important. One of the things I have noted when I have come to Winona is the collaboration among our community, organizations, and higher education. This community is in a unique position where we have those. So working with Engage Winona to address the um, achievement gap through our um, uh, racial and uh, addressing those kinds of things is extremely important as we look at the success of our students. The collaboration we have with our uh, Winona State University, St. Mary's University, Southeast Technical, provide our students opportunities that they may not have in other areas through our career and technical education programs and our REACH program that you may have heard about. I would urge you to really start looking at providing another Minnesota miracle. I had one board member last night refer to this. Um, in 1971, Governor Anderson had, uh, signed into law the change in funding for education. And I would urge you to look at one again because as we look at all the changes within education in the last many years, <coughs> Since 1971, there is time for another one because we need to look at how our students are different and the needs that they have in their classrooms. And being college, career, life ready means differently now than it did back in 1971. I'm now going to offer my board chair, Nancy Denser, the microphone. And welcome. Good morning, Chair, Madam Speaker, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, I thank you for coming to Winona. It's been um, an honor to see all of you and to participate. I was at the high school yesterday and um, just to see our students and actually um, members of the house that are working or have come from Winona. Um, my name is Nancy Denzer. I'm the school board chair for Winona Area Public Schools. I retired in 2018 after 34 years in public education. The first 15 years as a school counselor between St. Charles and Lewiston, and the last 19 as a high school and middle school principal with Rochester Public Schools. Um, it should come as no surprise to any of you that 34 years has changed the landscape of our students and the lives of our, our families. Um, educational changes and in our continued quest to provide high quality education opportunities for all of our students. 
34 years ago, the role of a school counselor was considerably different. The ratio of students to counselors was high, and the needs were more about helping find post-secondary opportunities, conflict resolution, scheduling classes, and preparing for PSAT and ACT testing. We didn't have mental health workers and limited numbers of social workers 34 years ago. Fast forward to today, the ratio of students to counselors is still high, and the needs are anything but those previously mentioned. Districts have added mental health and social workers as well as more counselors. The needs now are about safety, trauma, homelessness, mental health, suicide prevention, and on and on, beginning as our students walk through the doors in preschool. Our work in education has shifted to interventions, providing resources, and making sure that our children are assured that they are in a safe place to learn. WAPS has had declining enrollment for several years, which has resulted in some significant and painful budget reductions, as recently as $2.2 million this spring. While we have a tremendously talented staff of teachers and administration, the results of declining enrollment and budget reductions has taken a toll on them and the system as a whole. We are doing more with less, and needs of our students require additional skill sets that were not a part of teacher preparation programs. I continually worry about keeping our teachers healthy, yet I fear we ask more of them without giving them time, adequate compensation, and staff development to do both curriculum work and meet the increasing needs of our of social and emotional needs of our students. In my years of educational experience, keeping talented, healthy staff is essential because they are our hope for creating strong, capable students. I have great faith in the work that Winona Area Public Schools is doing in providing opportunities for students, partnering with businesses, and our three post-secondary institutions. It is my hope that you will fully fund public education. I'm sure you've heard that many times before. Um, and I'm completely convinced that fully funding our public education is the most important thing we can do for our children's future, but for our future as well, because they are our future. Um, I thank you very much for coming. I'm hoping that you can continue to work towards fully funding education. And I really thank you for coming to an honor. It's been an honor to have you here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the uh, next testifier is Linda. Um, I was just about to. Were you going to guess? I had been I had been prompted, but oh, uh, prompted. Uh, <laughs> but, at, but at any rate, uh, if you could identify yourself for the record and. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Chair. And a faculty member, I was That's going right. to point out as well. Oh, thank okay, you. Thank you. I am Linda Filesticker. I teach social studies at Winona Senior High School for the for about the last twenty plus years. Uh, so for those of you that want to do the math or are thinking about this just a little bit, yes, that means for the bulk of my career I was a department member with your esteemed colleague, Representative Pulowski. We shared a wall for all of that time. Some of you got to see that wall yesterday, right? Uh, and uh, for those of you that stick around for the rest of the day, which we'd love to see you stay here in Winona, at halftime of tonight's football game, we are honoring Representative Pulowski for all the work that he's done. So are you, you are welcome to join us. Um, we would love to have you there. It is uh, an honor that's long overdue. Okay. So uh, with that, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and members of the Ways and Means Committee, Speaker Portman, uh, thank you again for this opportunity to speak before you. Uh, you know, I'm going to reiterate many of the things that you've already heard, but I think maybe I can bring a little more of a, a personal perspective as someone that sits in the classroom with our kids. What does education look like today? And what impact and role do you, do you play in funding and supporting the lives of our students in Minnesota? Um, you're going to see that there's no surprise that mental health concerns do uh, come to the top of our list. The demand for mental health support outweighs our supply. At Winona Senior High School, we have one full-time psychologist, one part-time uh, social worker, and three counselors. That puts our counselors at an average of about 300 students per caseload. That's better than the national average, but it is still very, very much uh, too low for the students that we have. Um, with that said, I'm going to tell you our school is incredibly good at handling grief. We lose at least one student a year uh, to death. Uh, that could be suicide. About half are suicides. It's a, it's a fairly regular basis. And actually, our students have gotten used to this. Uh, there will be a, over the intercom, it'll come, uh, staff, would you please come to the multi-purpose room right after school? And you know what our students now say? Who died now? 
that's our reality at this point. Um, but again, we were assured last spring after our most recent suicide that what we're experiencing is perfectly normal. Our students and staff are exhausted by normal. And while we know that important work in people's ra uh, minds race to prevention of suicide, that's really just part of the issue here. The reality is in our hallways, in our classrooms, sit the students that are the survivors. They're the family members and friends of the people we've lost. And they are struggling in ways that they've never struggled before. And they need our support in ways that they've never needed before. And uh, as far as things like uh, uh, Chairman Denzer talked about, we need some more PD for our classroom teachers. But we also need more staff. Um, and I know you've worked very, very hard to increase the counselors and mental uh, health professionals that are in our schools, and I urge you to continue to do that. If we want our students to be successful emotionally and academically, we know that positive student-teacher relationships are critical. In order to have those strong relationships, you need to have a consistent teaching staff. We are in a district that is in consistent declining enrollment. When I began with Representative Pulowski, you probably remember, so we had 1,500 students and more in our, in our school, and just our high school. We are now under 1,000. This hasn't been overnight, it has been a slow and continual decline. Last spring we cut um, uh, over 20%, about 20% of our teaching staff throughout the district. Uh, layoffs are not always that severe, but they are still <coughs> common occurrence here in Winona in the springtime. Uh, when we get our actual enrollment numbers uh, become available and we identify the amount of funding we get from the state, there's an attempt to at least hire back some of those teachers. But here's the reality of what we're experiencing. Our best and brightest teachers have moved on to our neighboring districts that are more financially stable. And when they move, they take their time, their talents, but guess what? They also take their families. And so that's costing our community as well. So when you talk about stability of student connections, community connections, um, all of that is in decline when our teaching staff is, is inconsistent and lacks that stability. The reality is um, Representative Pulowski and myself are kind of the uh, endangered species, the teacher that committed to a 20 year plus career in one community. Uh, and, and there's going to be some repercussions for that. We are so lucky in WAPS, though, to have the WAPS Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization that you find in many, many school districts. They provide thousands of dollars every year to support student learning. They support field trips, smart boards, uh, wall maps, books, and a variety of other resources every year for our students. I am eternally grateful to the foundation, and I appreciate them being here, but I'm also sad by the fact that we rely on them so much. Field trips don't need to be a luxury. Um, smart boards and wall maps aren't but they're being funded as, as such uh, in our district. Yet, I have a lot of hope, okay? I have the sincere hope that you will fully fund public education. Uh, funding our public schools with increases that almost keep up with inflation some years isn't doing it right now. Our students deserve the best education possible. We as teachers, staff members, and administrators can give that to them, but we need your help. We can't do this alone. So the state of Minnesota must treat our students like the priority that you say they are, and not just talk about them as being that priority. So I urge you to commit to fully funding public education in our state. I thank you for your time. I thank you for coming to Winona. Those of you that came to Winona Senior High School, you're welcome anytime. You can come sit in my classroom whenever you wish. There's an open door. And uh, maybe I'll even show you where Representative Pulowski uh, began, which actually was where my career began as well as his substitute when he went into the legislature. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, the next uh, person is from uh, Winona uh, County, uh, Linda, uh, uh, Marcy uh, Koveski. Yes. Um, was that close? Very close. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm going to say let's stand up for just like 20 seconds, and I'm not going to be doing the exercise. <laughs> I do represent public health, and sitting is the new smoke. There you go. Okay, we'll stand. <laughs> we'll take your advice. <laughs> Very good. Can we wiggle? Okay, so um, <laughs> it does seem like you're in the funny name section of the I'll, I'll just interject on uh, what you just did. Uh, I had some back problems a number of years ago, and I went to the doctor, and he said, uh, are you still in the legislature? And I said, yes. And he said, are those chairs as comfortable as they appear on TV? And I said, oh, yes, they're very comfortable. And he said, that's your problem. And his advice to me was to get up 
periodically and move around. He said, go back and stand in the back of the House chambers or just move around. And I've done that consistently, and I haven't had back problems as a result of that. So I appreciate that. thank testimony. you for your advice here this morning. Uh, that does fall right in line with public health needs in our community and in our state. And if anybody would feel more comfortable standing while I'm talking, that's fine too. Um, and I've been, I go by many, I have gone by many names. Um, I've never been called Marcy. My name is Marie Cavessi. Um, and um, I appreciate the lineup of speakers because to me it points out um, that um, how much the work of Winona County and our resources um, relies on some of the groups you've already heard from. We have working relationships with all of the groups that have just presented with you um, and we rely on their um, resources and there's even more groups than just this morning. So, good morning, and on behalf of Winona County, we hope you have enjoyed your time here. We also hope you will not wait another 30 years to come back. Um, it has been good to see the interaction with our citizens and our staff throughout this week. And if you could believe it, it was actually in the 80s here on Monday, so sorry about the rest of the week, but <laughs> that is true. So today I'm prepared with some uh, comments on the Health and Human Services Department and some statements about our housing gaps. Um, first, the Health and Human Services Department. Um, if there are any discussion or plans regarding reorganization, counties need to be represented at the table. Um, as you know, counties are responsible for all the health and human services programs um, and this is the largest part of our budget, um, also since it's the largest part of the state budget. Um, it's the largest part of our $54 million budget and the most unpredictable with reimbursement levels not keeping pace with the needs and services. Um, this, this area covers about a third of our $54 million budget. Um, in 2017, we added uh, $4.7 which is about a quarter of our levy points um, from that year, um, just to balance the budget in human services. And this also included um, about $2.2 million in out-of-home placement um, programs. Um, we provide 98 social services programs and over 30 uh, maintenance, income maintenance programs. So you can see why we rely and work together with uh, so many community groups in the county. So today I want to talk about um, our needs in housing and um, how we got here. Um, I'm currently chair of the Winona County Board as well as a commissioner from District 2. And I've served on our Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and also our Community Services Advisory Committee um, and others, but these are the ones that are significant with us <coughs> in the midst of planning for a new jail and we're addressing housing gaps to include resources for all of our citizens. So I'm here today to talk about the gaps in housing and a little different than the testimony yesterday at the housing committee. Um, because we, it, I want to stress how important it is to fill these gaps and to develop a system of treatment and transition for many citizens. Housing is one of the main social determinants of health. Um, all of our uh, community programs include treatment, therapy, jobs, reuniting and stabilizing families, and these certainly belong as goals uh, for individual programs, but without stable housing, they can be very ineffective. Um, yesterday, you heard efforts in the city of Winona and Goodview to provide available worker-level housing so critical for our economic growth. So I have some data, and you should have a handout um, showing Winona County um, uh, data from the Minnesota Housing Partnership. Um, they have county by county data. Um, should have the top that looks like this. Um, this shows um, our median rent increased by 7% from 2000 to 2017, and our median income fell by 11%. So already there's a gap you can see. Um, and renters make up 30% of our 20,000 households. Um, and if you look at the bottom part of that page, um, it's showing 
uh, something about the cost burden, and I'm going to talk a little bit more directly about the cost burden when I present data from our Winona County Health uh, Needs Assessment. And this cost burden uh, information focuses on seniors. Uh, if you look on the second page, um, there's also a chart showing wages and housing affordability in Winona County which um, gives you some ideas of the amount of wage that's needed to be earned, the amount of program growth that's expected in these um, uh, wage areas, and uh, the gaps between affording a one-bedroom um, or median value home. Excuse me, a two-bedroom two apartment on this page. So I, I, I'm not going to speak any further on that. You can just um, kind of go through it um, later. But at a minimum wage, it takes 43 hours to a week to afford a one-bedroom apartment in Winona County. Um, in our 2019 Community Health Needs Assessment, and I've taken um, two excerpts, two pages of excerpts from that document um, for the second part of your handout, um, you can see at the chart that um, the number, the percentage of responses uh, talking about worry about not being able to pay rent, mortgage, and housing costs. Um, the two percentage groups are, first of all, the overall data, and then we did, um, we sent out surveys with 1,200 responses. That was about 31% uh, return. And then we also followed up with listening sessions. Um, including um, those needing translation services. So that's some of our special population. And their percent of worry about being not able to pay rent, mortgage, or housing costs was almost 50%. Um, and you can see th through the other areas, um, threat of services being shut off, problems with insect, problems with mold, water leaks, and in general problems with housing. This is some of the cost burden data that um, I, I promised you from, um, this, and this is not just seniors, this is across the board in Winona County. On the last page, um, you can look and at the very bottom, it's talking about um, how, how the responses came through, how strong they came through for severe housing problems, home ownership, and severe house, housing cost burden. They appeared in almost all the categories there. Um, and that is showing um, a, a severe um, housing problem with um, health needs across the board with Winona County. And the, the X's in the box indicate a problem area for Winona County. So um, that's some of our statistics in, in general um, and, and the start of some of our gaps. Excuse me. So this is clearly a group of citizens whose needs for secure and safe housing is not being met. Across the continuum, we also have gaps in our ability to supply housing for those leaving jail on probation or currently in our treatment and diversion courts. Safe housing is a critical part of rehabilitation and integration for these individuals. And we know that bringing families together reduces out of home placement costs, reduces the long-term effects of some of the trauma that was described by Dr. Ruth Charles, and also <coughs> increases family stability. Um, and so we do assist um, these individuals with job acquisition and reducing recidivism, and that's all part of their program. We have provided resources through a federal mental health grant for those who qualify in a program we call RAPS, Winona Rehabilitation Assistance Program, um, which provides housing assistance, and that has been the number one request for individuals in this program. Um, and it also seems to be the starting point for successful transition into becoming stable community members, but we lack comprehensive and consistent assistance for this area. Um, I'm also a retired teacher for blind and visually impaired children um, and families. And in my last years of teaching, I had four families that had issues of homelessness. And if you realize the, 
the slim uh, chances of that happening. A visually impaired child occurs one out of every 10,000 school children. So out of this small, small group of one out of every 10,000, I actually had four families dealing with homeless um, issues. Three families disappeared quite quickly. Um, I never heard from them. We never had a request for records. These are, are students with complex medical and educational needs and families were literally on the brink of, of disaster. Um, and one family lost their home in the 2007 flood and was able to successfully rebuild with the assistance of the federal funding. So I appreciate that. Um, in our community, I've been working with a citizen coalition addressing not only with the ACES Coalition and Mental Health Resources for Juveniles, but I have been working also with the Citizen Coalition addressing housing, homelessness, and poverty gaps. And they have identified connections in housing for these areas. We do operate a warming shelter during our winter months. And you know how cold it can be in Minnesota in the winter. And it operates between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. So you can see by these hours that there are many gaps throughout an evening and a day um, for these individuals. And we hope to um, be working to close some of those gaps. Um, I've sat in on sessions with our treatment court and with the veterans court. And I can state that stable housing is one of their first districts, uh, first difficulties. I did not realize. I'm somewhat naive, perhaps, that we actually had homeless veterans in our community with all the resources supposedly available for this group. And lastly, juvenile housing is a critical area. So you can see how all of this complicates our local efforts and strains resources in working now and in also planning on resources for our new jail. If some of these are challenges, so what would we say were some of the solutions? At a recent discussion with uh, Association of Minnesota Counties, we brainstormed some options and they are forming a statewide committee to identify further strategies, so there's more to come. In Winona County, we do rely on the Department of Administration data called Minnesota First. Um, it provides us with uh, data and an analysis of evidence-based programs. So we appreciate these resources and we regularly apply them with all of our programs. Um, one other, an additional resource could be renovating existing housing to provide safe housing for current renters and, and homeowners. This would actually work to provide local jobs, partnering with the Minnesota State Southeast College programs and vocational programs. And we can use local volunteers as such as our sentence to serve population, uh, Habitat for Humanity, senior advocates, etc. The continuum needs and gaps needs further cross-program cooperation between community, regional, and state resources, um, and it needs to include eligibility and reimbursement issues. Winona County has ongoing coalitions that take this on, but we need the ability to act on these reform, reforms and gaps in our system with additional housing options for those in, sincere, in severe need. So thank you, and I appreciate your time and attention in Winona County this week, and I look forward to continuing these discussions. Well, thank you. And uh, on the agenda, it appeared as Marcy, and you said it, it should be Marie? Yes. So we'll make sure that the minutes yes. uh, are corrected with your appropriate name. I'm Hungarian, in case anybody's questioning. <laughs> <laughs> my son actually had Representative Pulaski as a teacher. He says he was one of his favorite teachers. So very good. <laughs> There's more than one uh, former social studies teacher on the uh, committee here, but uh, pro probably at least in Winona, Palowski is number one. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, two more. No, one more. The other one has been up. Lucy's been up already. Oh, yeah. One, okay, so we have uh, uh, Karen uh, Soneman. Soneman? Karen. 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 Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair. County Madam, Attorney. County Attorney, yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Speaker, members of the Ways and Means Committee, hello, good morning. Um, I am Karen Sonneman, the Winona County Attorney, and I'm also the Chair of the Winona County Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, or CJCC for short. 
Um, it's been my great pleasure to meet many of you and talk with so many of you during this mini session. And I too thank Representative Kulowski for bringing it back to Winona. <coughs> I've been county attorney for about nine years now, having run for office in 2010 to bring criminal justice reform uh, in the form of SMART on crime initiatives to Winona County. Prior to be, being uh, the county attorney, I was a public defender for 20 years, and I served Houston County, Ms. Poppy's uh, home mm -hmm. town, I guess, mm -hmm. that's great. Uh, Fillmore County, Wabasha, where I think Representative Dreskowski is most, mostly from there, um, as well as Winona and some parts of Olmstead County. Um, I was also in private practice during 15 of those years, and prior to becoming a lawyer, I was a telecommunications radio analyst for the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission um, in the 1980s, so that's a ways back, uh, during the AT&T AT divestiture time um, and helped the commission through state and federal policy changes. I have a law degree from William Mitchell, now Mitchell Hamlin, and I have a master's degree in, in agriculture economics from the University of Minnesota and an economics degree from the University of Maryland. I also serve on the board of directors of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, but my remarks are not meant to be representative of the County Attorneys Association. These remarks are strictly in my capacity as county attorney and CJCC chair. I've met with many of you at the Wednesday night reception. You heard from me there on what we have done in Monona County to reform criminal justice. Several of you uh, on the Ways and Means Committee, I saw you yesterday at our session in the courthouse, and I really appreciate your presence there and learning about CJCC in more detail. Just a little review, um, CJCC is a body of elected and senior justice and community leaders, uh, such as Superintendent Fryhart, uh, City Councilman Michelle Alexander, a while back, uh, Chief of Police Paul Bostrick, um, for Winona, Commissioner Cavessi, and many others. Um, we meet once a month uh, and we coordinate systematic response to justice problems. We operate in a culture of collaboration with a common purpose and shared vision at the leadership and operational level of our members. Through that work, we've established early intervention, diversion, treatment court, and community reentry and stabilization programs for the benefit of the community at large. We foster an environment where we can have a better understanding of crime and criminal justice problems, greater cooperation among agencies and units of government, and more effective resource allocation. We believe we enhance the system and individual agency productivity and performance, provide better quality criminal justice programs and personnel, and increase public confidence in and support for criminal justice processes. We aid government leaders in evaluating and making decisions about the justice system and its cost and performance. Many local governments, and this is a quote about CJCs in general on the national uh, uh, level, are finding that comprehensive system-wide planning, interagency and cross-jurisdictional, helps to streamline the entire local system of justice, eliminating duplication, filling service gaps, and generally improving the quality of service while controlling costs. But while we have had success in establishing some programs, it has not been without difficulties, and sustaining these programs and having funds to continue our reform efforts is always a worry. That's why I have gray, or white, gray hair now. Um, the work of criminal justice reform is challenging in a system of many working parts, many of which don't always work well together. While CJCC attempts to break down those barriers, many times we have been thwarted by old structural models of access to funding and service delivery. As uh, Ruth Charles talked about this new, well it's not new really, but the advanced childhood ex um, experiences, trauma informed, the explosion of social media, everything has changed. And delivery of human services, including mental health and substance abuse treatment services, as well as the lack of simple services such as providing a bus pass, funds for getting a GED degree, just simple things that could make a difference between someone staying out of jail or finding themselves back in jail. <clears throat> so among many of these roadblocks we have encountered in establishing and sustaining the programs that we have started 
are access to existing funds and service delivery that seems to be, and this is my opinion, locked into programs that are so tightly bound by rules, particularly the human service programs. Sometimes I feel that uh, we're putting together programs with duct tape, duct tape, gum, and chicken wire. Um, we make do with what we have, kind of like when we were kids, remember the mousetrap game? We build the mousetrap and hope it, it, it works, you hope it doesn't fall apart, because then you'll have to start over. Um, what I'm asking you to consider is that continued success in criminal justice reform requires shifting the paradigm. We need to focus on making smart investments where they matter most. And at the local level, criminal justice reform happens on the ground, in the trenches. We need your support to encourage and allow for the establishment and continued development of support of system-based, collaborative, multidisciplinary team designed and run programs that are creative, efficiency, and effective solutions. These programs can reduce the number of mentally ill persons in jail. They can address adult and juvenile populations by reducing criminal and delinquent behavior by prevention, early intervention, to divert kids and adults from the criminal justice system, or help them avoid entering the system in the first place. Criminal justice is really a public health issue. It's a housing issue. It's an education issue, and it's an economic development issue. And <coughs> looking at your budget report, 30.5% uh, of the state's budget, or $14.7 billion, will go to human services in 2020-21, but only 5.1% goes to public safety and the judiciary. I'm asking you to take a critical look at the budget and the old models of health and human service delivery that could be radically organized. Shift the paradigm. <clears throat> Traditional prosecution will keep people who just are plain scary off the streets and who need to go to jail or prison. But most people's criminal problems are rooted in chronic poverty, lack of stable housing, untreated mental illness, and substance abuse. Mm -hmm. So shift the paradigm. Help us sustain and approve the programs that we have that work to establish other programs that we need to continue our work in criminal justice reform. Thank you, and please please contact me if you would like further and more detailed information about what I've only touched on the surface. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, that uh, concludes the uh, number of people that we had that were signed up in advance, but I do want to ask if there's anybody in the audience then that wasn't on our list that would like to comment uh, before the committee, before we go to uh, questions. Okay, it looks like everybody that uh, wanted to uh, participate from the audience ha has done so. Uh, we'll go to uh, any questions that uh, any of the committee members may have, and if you could uh, maybe uh, indicate uh, who you would like to pose the question to. You all have a list of uh, who testified. So uh, any questions at this point? Representative Halsman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Not a question so much as just a response to the overwhelming um, story that's been told. I confess that uh, Linda file stickers led me to tears, which I haven't quite recovered from yet. But here, here's what I heard uh, from the energy of Dr. Charles and Brian Verdig, um, and from the public school uh, and, and, and the county commissioner. I heard the word collaboration over and over, which tells me you're all working together, and ultimately we saw on all of these challenges that you've uh, outlined so well, we need one another, no, no one entity can do it. And so that was encouraging to me that I heard from, from each uh, group, collaboration, you're all um, working with one another. And I wanted to particularly thank uh, Marie Kovetsky because it, the timeliness of this. The first two pages, that's what we hear from across the state. That's very similar. But the work you've done with the Winona County Community Health Needs Assessment, the detail of that third and fourth page, uh, come at a good time as we're looking ahead uh, to the next legislative session for uh, it, are there other policy issues we need to be looking. So those two pages and the detail of that is not something I've seen in other parts of the state. So for me, that was, um, that was helpful information. So mostly just thank you all for an amazing story you've told. Thank you, and uh, um, I 
just pulled some excerpts. That's a 50-page report. I did provide the full um, online, which unbelievably I think is four lines of things to type in, but um, that will get you to the 50-page report, which has other details and other information. We are uh, recording the meeting, so if in the future, uh, if somebody is posed with a question or would like to comment, we'll need you uh, to come up to uh, be picked up on the mic. But I, I think your voice carried uh, perhaps well enough to be picked up. Uh, any further uh, questions or comments from uh, committee uh, members? Yes. Can I confirm? Mm -hmm. Use the mic, please. I was this is uh, Representative Wagenius, by the way. your list of community health needs and your rankings of community health rankings below Minnesota average. And I must say I was surprised to see that air pollution and drinking water violations were checked. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, our public health department has been working um, mostly in those areas. Some of it comes from housing, um, um, issues with mold. Some of it is um, air inversion that seems to settle in our valleys um, and it either aggravates or can have an onset with um, people who's, who have asthma. So um, those are specifically conditions that people reported in the data. Um, the water quality issue um, is a little um, more complicated even than that because um, in the county um, we have the karst topography as you know um, which gives us caves and creeks and you know streams and sinkholes but it also provides um, pretty steady and um, sometimes almost immediate access to our groundwater so we're working carefully with different sources of pollution we have had townships uh, report as much as 30% of their private wells. These are wells that were voluntarily tested, so it's not a complete um, number of wells. But 30, up to 30% of their wells were um, over the limits in terms of nitrates. So we're addressing a lot of those issues, and I, I think you maybe have seen some of that for those that heard from our Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and, and it's been coming through with a lot of the programs we're offering as resources to try to, you know, once there's nitrates in your water, there's no mitigation per se, um, and one solution is to dig deeper and to have, you know, maybe a different um, well structure, um, safer from intrusion. Um, but we're working very hard to use, to, to work with the geology that we have and protect water as a vital resource as well as fresh air. So, yes, um, and th the issues here, um, they're not like single issues. These occur in multiple capacities, so that makes it even more complicated. Um, thank you. If I could follow up, Mr. Chair. Representative McGinney. <coughs> I'm concerned about the nitrates in water, but more concerned um, because the Department of Agriculture's own data says that where there is nitrogen, there will be pesticides. And where there's a lot of nitrogen, and if you're over the limit, there will be a lot of pesticides. So for families, uh, I worry about the children. And uh, the fact that the state doesn't provide resources, uh, since generally speaking, those families did not create the problem. Um, it's something that we need to think about, and it would be helpful to have more input. <coughs> uh, I agree, this is a very serious issue. Um, and agriculture is about a third of our economic um, section of the county. So we have been working very carefully. Um, there are um, programs with re sponsoring regenerative agriculture. Um, this is where you have cover crops on the ground all year, um, you, which reduces the amount of fertilizer that people have to use, and also um, working with farmers to reduce tilling. Um, these are strategies that not only improve water quality, but also improve soil health 
and reduce the farmer's costs. Um, if they're not tilling, that saves some time. Um, the cover crops can be interseeded right with the, uh, the cash crops. And, and so, uh, you know, we're really trying to work, and it's mostly farmer to farmer, but um, the, the support of our soil and water and conservation district cannot be underestimated. Um, they're working very diligently. Um, we're also watching things as um, uh, storm sewer drainage from cities. Um, we have another coalition working um, on healthy Lake Winona, which is in the city, but is also fed by some of our creeks. So um, it's, it's a very complex problem how water moves throughout our county and what sources um, approach it, both good and bad. Up one more time. Absolutely, I totally appreciate the karst problem and the long-term solutions that you are looking at because I think it will work. But in the short term, exactly. the kids are drinking that water. And they, that brings to me the question of what's our responsibility for filtering that drinking water in an individual house. Well, we've been encouraging um, well testing, as I said. And once the uh, residents are aware of the levels in their, in their water, in their well, um, most of them don't drink the water. But that's, as you, as you can see, that would be a, a great inconvenience. And when you can't access healthy water at your own kitchen tap, that's a problem. I, I have a well, and um, I live in the city, but um, our water is, has been tested to, to be safe to drink, obviously. Um, and it's thousands of years old water. It's one of our natural resources that we really work hard to preserve and to protect in Winona County. Not without much controversy on my day, but. <laughs> we have uh, five people that are going to ask questions or comments. Uh, and we're not too pressed for time. We have a few minutes yet, but because of the schedule, the rest of the day we'll need to adjourn by uh, five minutes before the hour or on the hour, just as a reminder to, uh, to members. Representative Dabney, you were next on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the, the WAPS folks, I think is how I'm supposed to call you. Uh, you. You did an equally powerful presentation yesterday at the high school on the challenges students are facing with mental health. Um, how do you understand the increase in the rates of depression and anxiety that we're seeing in students across the country, not, not just here in Winona. How do you understand prevention as a part of the response? And somebody's, one of you is going to pull the short straw and have to come up and try to yeah, answer that we, question. I was just going to say we'll need you to come up to the table, which, whichever. Or both. Uh, just a preference, Superintendent, I'm a strong supporter of school-linked mental health, of uh, we, we carried in the House this year funding for additional school support personnel. Unfortunately, the Senate would have none of that. Um, so it's, 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 it's a both and. How do we respond to those children who are struggling? How do we under, better understand this epidemic? Thank you, and I guess I drew the short straw. Okay. <laughs> but I do have support. Um, if you I could continue identifying things, yourself oh. for the record in case someone would listen to the hearing so um, we know. Dr. Annette Fry Height, superintendent of Winona Area Public Schools. And I think a key to prevention of this is the collaboration you see among the county, the school district, and any other organizations within here to help support the families. So providing that support, and even starting at early as um, birth, and I know our early childhood programs, we start meeting with those families at birth and work with those families, and if we can provide services and help that, we can prevent some of those things from happening. But I think it's really a, a multi-pronged approach in order to help that. The affordable housing, good medical care, all those kinds of things help with the prevention of that. And then when they become students at the Winona Area Public Schools, they're in a better place to begin their school schooling, so that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, I'm Nancy Denzer, the chair of the school board. <coughs> um, having worked in that capacity for a number of years as a school counselor, um, mm. and I, I, I'm kind of unique in that school counseling and principals don't usually marry. We, I did. Um, and it, it really makes a difference, I think, with all of our students that our teachers have enough 
training to be able to address it because you can't see it. Mm -hmm. You have to get to know the students and relationships with students is vital to making things happen. So we increase class size, which makes that more difficult. We create we create things that happen to our students where they're not safe, but we don't recognize it because we don't know all the information to ask. So for me over the years it's you know, seeing more and more students come with one or more trauma, you know, qualifiers, and they're coming in very early on. We don't recognize it until we see multiple indicators, and then by some of the, then it's kind of too late to make a really big impact. But you know, over the course of 34 years, um, I attended many funerals for students who were victims of suicide. And as each one of those happen, you learn that you really need to ask more questions of students, but you also have to get to know them, and relationships really is the most important thing we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, next will be Representative Poppy. <laughs> the teacher also oh. stepped forward. Okay. Welcome back. I didn't see that you should step forward, so That's okay. feel free to comment. Linda and if you're going to identify yourself yes, again. Linda Filestick, a social studies teacher. I think um, when, we, when we look at the complexity of this um, and the changing dynamics that we're seeing with mental health, because we get a lot of questions as to why do we see this, this increase in, in mental health needs and services. And I think also when we look at the perspectives of uh, the opioid crisis, of, of meth in, in rural areas where we've seen that, now we're seeing the children <laughs> of those folks now coming in and we're just starting to understand the effects of, of, of those two crises in our communities and the increased needs. So when you talk about trauma, um, that's, that's one of the pieces that we're dealing with. And so then we're also at the high school level and the middle school level and unfortunately even younger, uh, really have to work continued again on drug prevention programs. How do we make sure that our kids do not um, self-medicate because in many cases that's what they're doing uh, to try to maybe survive some of the or deal with some of the trauma they've had and then kind of perpetuate that cycle. So some of what we have to do is to break the cycle of what they've experienced at home. Uh, and so we bring in professionals when you talk about working with community members and other organizations to try to prevent some of those things from happening and break those cycles. It becomes really important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Representative Poppy. You pass. No, I was I was pointing to. Oh, I see. Okay, we had you on the list. Okay, so the list got a little shorter. Representative Scott. Just a quick question for the county commissioner on the housing issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just wondering on the data that you provided for us. You said thirty percent um, of your population are rent, and I'm just wondering if student housing is included in that number. Very simple question. Um. I would have to check on that. This is the Minnesota Housing Partnership data, so I was not involved with actually collecting that data. Um, that would probably account for some of the renting from the county. Um, I do have a comment on the previous question about um, preventing and, and working on mental illness, um, specifically anxiety and depression. I think many of you heard from our our community services director, Karen Sanis, and she was um, speaking about a program called Families First, which is a pilot program. And we're pleased to be rolling it out here in Winona County. Um, this is, again, another example of, of an evidence-based program that we um, latched onto through the Minnesota Department of Administration data um, on the importance of family home visits. Okay, we know that if we can have an impact on families to keep them stable, to reduce those trauma issues with children. Um, over 80% of our out-of-home placement um, uh, families are related to substance abuse, so that's an issue we're addressing. Um, we also have training with our sheriff's department, and a lot of it does come down to providing stable housing and stable services for those families. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we're at that uh, point, though. Those were all that I had on the list, but I did indicate that I had a couple of more, and that would be the uh, minority lead to make some conclusion uh, or to uh, make some uh, comments, if you will. 
and uh, then I'll recognize the uh, Majority Leader to, to do the same. So, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to everyone who's uh, taken part in this event, including my colleagues uh, and members of the community, and especially to the staff who work so hard to organize the event. I know it, these things don't happen automatically. It takes a lot of time and planning and effort to make them happen. Uh, it's uh, been obvious in our time here in Winona that uh, you have a lot of resources in this community, a lot of people who, who care about your residents and your environment, and uh, that is a tremendous asset. I'm sure it's been obvious to you that uh, we have many demands put on the state budget, uh, and uh, in order to meet those demands to the best of our ability, we have to prioritize, we have to make choices, we have to make decisions. We also have to make sure that the state dollars are spent effectively. Um, and that's, uh, there's been some items in the news recently indicating that we're not doing the best job of that. And I would hope that uh, as we approach the next session, we will carefully analyze how we spend tax dollars. Because when we waste tax dollars, we're not meeting the real needs. We're, we're uh, pouring money down an empty hole, so to speak. I can't uh, conclude my remarks without mentioning agriculture as a farmer myself. Uh, Agriculture right now is, is experiencing a very challenging time uh, in many ways, uh, and the weather is just one of them. Uh, uh, these continued rains are making this harvest season a real challenge for many farmers all across the state. Uh, and I can't, I have to mention that and make sure that uh, a community like this that is, is dependent on agriculture in many ways, as we learned as we visited the port and other aspects, uh, it's very important. So thanks again to everyone who's taken part, and thanks especially to the community members that have stepped forward to, to educate us. Uh, it's, it's been a great, uh, great experience to be here in Winona. Uh, one more thing, Mr. Chair. I, you know, there's been, lately there's been an effort to rename a few things across the state. I would hope you would resist the effort to rename the city Pulowskiville. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard the name Pulowski quite a bit in the last few days, but uh, he has had a, a long history of representing the community and has done a very good job in St. Paul. I think we all acknowledge that. Um, for some concluding uh, comments then from the Majority Leader, uh, Ryan Winkler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you um, all the members particularly who took time to be here. This is not, uh, just so everyone knows, this is not mandatory work on behalf of the members of the House of Representatives. This is a part-time job. And we concluded our official business when we passed the state budget in uh, the end of May. And so the people who are here today uh, and who've been here in this community in the last three days are taking time out of their lives, their professional responsibilities, their family obligations in order to be here. And uh, as much as we need to thank the community of Winona for all of the work in welcoming us and, and putting the uh, time into making this successful, I would like to acknowledge the high rate of participation from the members of the House of Representatives. And you might not always hear great stories about politics or about how we work at the state capitol, but regardless of our political views, uh, we have a group of people uh, who are uh, overwhelmingly committed to the public good, care very much about the future of the state, the people of the state, and may have differences of opinion about the best way to meet uh, the, and increase and improve the public welfare overall, uh, those differences of opinion are not uh, indications that we don't believe in the, in the same basic values. Uh, but what, I, what strikes me, um, is, uh, the real value of the mini-session, uh, is that we, at the state level, deal in this pie chart of categories. And we have health and human services, we have higher education, we have property taxes, we have K-12 education, et cetera. And what we and the um, kind of categories of funding, the uh, state agencies, the counties that we uh, administer health and human services through, all of those things are kind of abstractions. And what we have seen in Winona is uh, the way that our work at the state level is uh, translated into addressing community needs. And we're in some, you know, we're hearing a little bit of a tale of two cities, uh, which is typical of our society in general. We have tremendous economic uh, wealth being generated, beautiful community institutions, but simultaneously uh, great social needs and cracks in the foundations of our society that we need to find ways to address. And I hope for me what I take away is uh, a real need to understand that the, how we can change our budgeting 
our program uh, design and the work that we do so that the communities in Minnesota that are actually trying to address adverse childhood uh, experiences, addiction, mental health, suicide, uh, socially dysfunctional behaviors of many kinds, uh, economic stagnation and poverty, racial and social divides, environmental contamination, housing instability, uh, health care inaccessibility, all of those things you're trying to address because it matters to the people in your community and we need to do a better job of having the programs we create and fund actually allow you to do that work. Uh, and we can see that by being so in-depth for three days uh, and by coming to a place and seeing it firsthand and seeing those experiences. And so I hope, uh, Madam Speaker, that you have uh, re-engaged the Minnesota House in a, uh, I really, I think mini session is kind of like a, not a great name for what we do. Um, we could work on that. But um, I think this is a good experience for us to understand where our uh, high-level abstract and partisan decision-making uh, is then um, affected in communities. And so I hope that we can continue to do that because we need to be better educated, not just about our own districts and our own politics, but about how different parts of the state need us to do a better job. And so that's, for me, it's a big takeaway, and I hope it's the start of a much longer process. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Winkler. Uh, we uh, will need to adjourn, but I also want to uh, thank the people uh, here this morning that uh, testified before the Ways and Means uh, Committee. And uh, in addition to uh, committee members, I do want to acknowledge we had other members uh, that are not on the committee sitting in, and including our leadership, the Speaker of the House, Majority Leader, and uh, Representative Torkelson representing uh, his caucus here this morning, and I uh, want to thank uh, Everyone, you had a very bipartisan group sitting here, uh, and uh, we really appreciate all the members' uh, involvement, but uh, we do have to acknowledge uh, the community. And uh, I've been in the legislature uh, beginning in January, my 48th year, and I've participated in every single mini session, and they've all been very successful. But uh, Winona has always uh, been a very welcoming community, and I want to thank you for that. Some of us come down in addition to the many sessions. I do want to point that out when we reference the 30 years. Uh, Capital Investment Committee has been here many times through the years. Uh, the LCCMR Committee, just to mention a couple that I've served on and been in Winona for uh, countless times um, in the last 30 years. But there's something unique about the, uh, the mini session, and maybe we'll have to think of a better name, but uh, because that brings a good cross-section of the entire legislature together and a good cross-section of the community. And uh, I should acknowledge the fact that uh, this particular uh, mini-session also involved Rochester and some of the other uh, communities here in southeastern Austin. Minnesota. <laughs> in Austin, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And we do have to uh, board the buses by 11 o'clock, and that's about two or three minutes, I think. Oh, 11.15. Okay, I was told we needed to adjourn by 11. Okay, so we have a few minutes for the bus, so maybe some members want to mingle a bit with uh, people in the audience. And with that, uh, meeting adjourned.